This is the beautiful day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a wonderful day to be worshiping outside in God's good creation. And after a few weeks of cold and rain, um, we deserve it. What an election week this has been. After a week that is focused on what our differences are, it is good to gather where we are reminded of our primary identity as children of God. And here we are not independents or Democrats or Republicans. Here we remember that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And so it is good to be here after a stressful week. I will be gone for the next two weekends, and um, David Sutton will be leading worship. We will continue to worship outside, and that will certainly uh, be a treat for everyone. There will be no jaywalkers this week because that um, school is out on Wednesday, but just to remind parents um, to begin helping them learn the first Noel. And while that may sound like a strange um, Christmas carol to start with, you know, the, the ending is easy enough for the youngest to remember, and it does tell part of the story that the children understand. Your session has called a congregational meeting following worship today for the purpose of electing two people to serve as elders in the class of 2023, one to serve in the class of 2021, and to elect our 2021 nominating committee. So now let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. to worship comes from Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children, we will tell to the coming generation of the glorious deeds of the Lord and God's might and the wonders that the Lord has done. Let us worship God together.
Has anyone among us sinned this week? Has anyone failed to reflect God's goodness, wisdom, and love? Has anyone ignored God's commandments and neglected to do justice? Has anyone trusted in earthly rulers and turned from the way of Christ? Absolutely. Every one of us have fallen short, and God knows it. No one is exempt from the way of sin, and no one is beyond the reach of God's mercy. Let us trust in the mercy that awaits us as we confess our sins to God and before one another. Let us pray. Loving God, as we examine our life together, our impulses and actions, we see all too clearly that our choices do not reflect your commandments. We fail to love you and we neglect to love our neighbors. You tell us to be ready to meet you at any moment, to stay awake to your presence and be prepared to do your will. We remain distracted and complacent, disillusioned or paralyzed. We ask for your wisdom. Focus our attention on our Savior that we might see your vision for this world. Forgive our past mistakes so that we will be free to be the salt and light you call and create us to be. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new life has already begun. Friends, believe and trust in this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us ring our praises. to me. 
Let us pray. Alpha and Omega, you are our beginning and our end. Nothing in this life or in this world is absent of your love, presence, and power. As we quiet our minds and look to set our worries aside, even if for a moment, send your spirit. Give us wisdom, instruct us, shape us, guide us, send us. May your word read and proclaimed be embodied in our actions. Amen. Today's reading comes from the end of Matthew's gospel, just before Jesus is um, arrested, just before the Passion narrative. Chapters 24 and 25 of the Gospel of Matthew are a series of parables and teachings about the end time, about the end of the age, about Jesus, the Son of Man, coming in glory. Matthew's community, the, the original audience, um, thought that Jesus would return in their lifetime. And by the time Matthew wrote his Gospel, some in the community were questioning his return, some were follow, falling away, and some had lost the vigor of their faith. Now, a couple of points that Matthew makes clear in, this, in these two um, chapters is that no one knows when the end of the age will come, and so speculation is futile. And secondly, these chapters convey an absolute and utter confidence that Jesus will come again and that the end of the age will be at an unexpected hour. And so watchful waiting is important. So these parables throughout these two chapters convey an urgency in what seems to be for us here on earth, an endless future. So today's text is considered an Advent text as it is talking about waiting, um, but it is the lectionary lesson for today. Hear now God's word from Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. Then the kingdom will be of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for your lamps, are for our lamps are going out. But the re wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Waiting is hard. Delay is hard. And it seems that we have done a lot of waiting in 2020. We waited through stay-at-home orders in the spring we waited for the next phase of reopening, each phase seeming to come a little later than we had anticipated. We waited to go on vacation and visit family. We are waiting for this pandemic to end. 
And this week, we are waiting for the election to finalize. And though we were warned that tabulating these votes would take extra time, I doubt many of us were quite prepared for the delay. <coughs> Waiting is surely one of the words to describe 2020. And in many ways, waiting has shaped our lives this year. If we understand Advent to be a season of waiting, of waiting for the birth of the Christ child, for waiting of the coming again of Jesus in glory, of waiting for Christ to come to us in our everyday lives, then one could say that Advent started very, very early this year. The 10 bridesmaids in the parable are waiting. In the wedding customs of the time, guests would assemble at the house of the bride where they would be entertained by the bride's parents while waiting for the bridegroom. When the bridegroom would approach to, um, I don't know what you say, get his bride, um, to, uh, the guest along with all of the bridesmaids with lighted torches, would go out to greet him, and then the bridesmaids would lead this, lead this festive procession to his parents' house, to the groom's parents' house, where the ceremony would take place. For whatever reason, and the parable doesn't tell us, the bridegroom is delayed. In fact, he's delayed a lot. He doesn't show up until midnight. At this point, all the black bridesmaids are asleep. At the, when they hear he's coming, though, they all jump up with eager anticipation and trim their lamps. And it is at this point that we find that five bridesmaids, the ones who are called foolish, have no oil. When asked if they can borrow oil, the wise bridesmaids say that there's not enough for them to share. They should go to town to buy some more oil. Somehow, at midnight, they're supposed to find that. And off the foolish bridesmaids go, and when they return, the door is shut and they are turned away. Amazing grace is not how this parable sounds to my ear. Make no mistake, this is a troubling parable and it is a confusing parable, even for scholars. For one thing, where in the world is the bride? What's a wedding without a bride? But the bigger issue, of course, is that on the surface, this parable doesn't fit with other things that Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew about how if we knock, the door will be opened. The refusal of the wise bridesmaids to shear the oil doesn't fit with Jesus blessing the five loaves and two fish and sharing that until the thousands of people gathered have, are satisfied and even have abundant leftovers. It doesn't fit with Jesus saying that if someone asks for your coat to give them your shirt as well. It doesn't fit with searching for the one lost lamb. And it doesn't even fit with, the confounding, with another confounding parable where the kingdom is compared to a landowner who includes everyone in the work of the vineyard and pays them equally no matter what time they show up. As the old Sesame Street song goes, one of these is not like the other. This parable just doesn't sound like Jesus. It doesn't feel like gospel. Now, to be fair, we can't forget about the narrow gate or the weeping and gnashing of teeth. We can't forget about the parable of one being tossed out of the wedding for being improperly dressed. And of course, when we read about the doors being shut here, it echoes the words in Matthew 7 when Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only the one who does the will of my Father. This is all to say that in our tradition, we emphasize that scripture interprets scripture. No one passage stands in isolation, and we must take care in reading, not to read too much into any one passage. I can't resolve all the inconsistencies in this parable, only to say that I don't think this is a parable about who gets in and who's left out. And even if it is, the parable makes clear that the only judgment made by anyone in this parable is the bridegroom. It seems to me that this parable is more about life on this side of eternity. That's where all the action in this parable takes place. Really, the wise and the foolish bridesmaids are very similar. They're all invited to the wedding. They all come dressed, carrying their lamps. They all fall asleep while waiting for the bridegroom. And they all jump up in eager anticipation when they hear that the bridegroom is on the way. Best I can see, there are only two differences between the foolish and the wise in this narrative. One is that when it is announced that the bridegroom is here, the foolish realize they have no oil. And secondly, when the bridegroom arrives, the foolish bridesmaids are not there. They have gone into town to buy more oil. So is it that what makes the bridesmaids foolish is that they did not prepare for the delay of the bridegroom? After all, if he had arrived on time, they would have all danced merrily into the banquet hall. Or could it be that the problem is rather that at the critical moment when they were to welcome the bridegroom, they had abandoned their posts? They were foolish because they acted as if their primary job was to have oil in their lamps when this was only a means to an end. Their primary job was to welcome the bridegroom and to accompany the bridal party with joy. Because they got distracted with secondary concerns, they missed the bridegroom's arrival and missed out on the party. I don't know which it is, and I'm not sure that it's important for us. I think the message for us in many ways is the same. You know, as Christians, when thinking about the end times, we tend to fall into two different ditches. Some Christians fall into the ditch of trying to determine when the time will come, identifying symbolic images in the Bible and matching them with world events to try to figure out some timetable and even a script for the end. Jesus basically says that's a waste of time. The other ditch into which Christians often fall, and I put myself in this category, is complacency and distraction. Because we don't really expect Jesus will come anytime soon, we forget the urgency of the mission he has given us. Whether the bridesmaids are foolish because they lack preparation for the delay or because they were not present to greet the bridegroom, as I've said, I think the implications for our lives are the same. This parable and this section states clearly, Christ will come again to make all things new, and that is certain. And in the meantime, we are to live faithful, hope-filled, courageous lives. Even when the bridegroom is nowhere in sight, even when we cannot see signs of justice rolling down like water, 
We are called to continue to serve and hope and pray and wait for the promised victory of Christ, to live with a sense of expectancy. This is not about how to get through the door to the other side. This is not works righteousness. It is about the living of our days on this side of eternity. It is about recognizing and welcoming Jesus in our lives when he comes even today. And the best ways for us to, for our eyes to be open to Jesus is to be about the work of the kingdom in our own lives. Now, yes, yeah, sometimes we may find ourselves caught up in a really big movement. But I encourage you to first think small. We are most likely to have our eyes being open to Jesus when we are being faithful in our relationships when we are practicing forgiveness and kindness, when we are feeding the hungry in our neighborhood, and when we are avoiding the caricatures each political party makes of the other. Let us be clear, Trump supporters cannot be summed up as ignorant and racist. Biden supporters cannot be summed up as elitist and intolerant and socialist. We, the church, have an important role to play in the healing of our nation. How and when do we see Christ come? John Buchanan writes this. Christ com Jesus comes when Christian people hope and never give up, Jesus comes when faithful disciples express love and compassion and work for justice. Jesus comes when critically ill people know they are ultimately safe in God's love. Heaven breaks into earth when faithful men and women live in hope and give themselves to the work of the kingdom feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, spreading the good news, and making disciples. Yes, we are waiting for this pandemic to end. We are waiting for this election to end, and both of these are big deals. But pandemic and politics should not be what ultimately shapes our lives. It should not ultimately be what shapes our lives, our attitudes, or our relationships. We are waiting for the sure coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes all things new, who will make justice roll down like waters. And we are waiting for that sure coming both in our daily lives now and one day in final glory. Our lives are to be shaped by the hopeful expectation of this great day. And in the meantime, we are to go about being the people of God and doing the things that God calls us to do. It is easy to become complacent and distracted and forget the great hope for which we are waiting. The scripture in our daily prayer this morning was from Psalm 90, and it ends with this verse. Teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. May it be so. Amen. I have not received any prayer concerns um, today. I know that um, uh, John Miller is doing a little bit better. Um, when I talked to Bobby this week, he was about the same. Um, so I don't have any new prayer concerns. Let us go now to God in prayer. 
holy and eternal God, maker of all things seen and unseen, we rejoice this morning in your good creation. For the songs of birds around us, the hint of color in the trees, the fresh smell of the air, and enough sun and warmth to make this a great morning to worship outside. For all of this, we give you thanks. We thank you, great God, that you came to us once as a baby in your son, Jesus, that you will come again at the end of time and that you come into our lives continually with compassion, redemption, and hope. Open our eyes to your coming among us now and give us the grace to live confidently and expectantly as your faithful disciples. Lord Jesus Christ, you are our way to life, justice, and peace. In you, we are called to find our unity. Come into our broken lives and nation and bring healing. Help us to be willing to bow before you in repentance and meet each other with forgiveness. Consume the prejudice and pride that consumes us and lead us into all humility. Empower us to be agents of your reconciliation. We pray your blessing to be upon all public servants and upon elected officials who are now serving, who are preparing to take office as well as those who are still waiting the outcome of the election. Rule the hearts of all leaders and public servants and give them the wisdom and strength to know your will and to do it. As we celebrate the freedom to exercise our right to vote this week, we remember and give thanks for all who have fought and served in the armed forces to protect freedoms at home and abroad. We thank you for the sacrifices they and their families have made for our country. We give thanks for those who have and are serving who are still healthy and whole. But Lord God, we know that so many of those, for so many of those, that is not the case. And so we offer special prayers for healing and wholeness for all who have seen combat and ret have returned home with wounds visible and invisible. May we as a nation show our gratitude to them through the care they receive and may none of their wounds be dismissed. Gracious God, help us as a people to be wise and prudent in our personal and communal practices as the coronavirus rages across the country. Give strength, wisdom, and endurance to medical workers, some stretched to their physical and emotional limits. Bring healing to the sick and comfort those who mourn. Lord God, our hope and trust is in nothing less than your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help our lives to reflect this truth. In his name we pray. Amen.
charge. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you this day and forever.